word of God declares, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him, I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snares of the fowl and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler and you shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrows that fly by day nor of the pestilence that walk in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at the noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near to you. Let us pray our God and our Father, Lord. We're thankful, Lord, that we have scripture that tells us that if you hide us in that secret place, that we shall surely be hidden. Lord God, we ask that you will bless this service, Lord. Allow your Holy Spirit to be in this place. And as the praises go up, Lord, allow your blessings to come down. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church of God say amen and amen. family, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I hope you are doing well. This is the time of tithe and offering. And I came here to encourage you to be a heaven good citizen. One day, King Solomon wrote this about our financial life to suggest a way through which 
we may exercise our submission to Jesus and to his word. He wrote this in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and uh, with the first fruits of all your increase, so your bounds will be filled with plenty and uh, your vats will overflow with new wine. God promised us a lot of blessing for returning tithe and offering. He promised to, to open the gate of heaven for us if we choose to return in our tithe and offering for every first fruit we have. To honor the Lord with first fruit means that we give our best to God first before meeting any other expenses. On the other hand, one of the first signs of our unwillingness to submit to Jesus and to his word is the disinclination to return tight and to give offering of all our increase before any other expense I mean. Limited submission generates limited blessings while unlimited submission brings overflowing blessings. I know we are passing a challenging time and also things are mean to everybody. Some of us lose their job and some of us are getting the assistance from the government. But let me tell you, everything comes in your hand is the first fruit you have. And uh, whenever you don't pay your tax, the IRS is on your back and you can end up in jail. But our God won't put us in jail. He promised to bless us. He promised that we are citizens of heaven. So we can plead allegiance to him. Whenever we understand that, we understand that God is there to bless us. While we humbly bring our tithe and offering to the Lord today as the first part of our increase, let us ask him to give us a submissive heart and to help us to be willing to say, speak Lord for your servant, yes. Let's pray. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you, we honor you. We know that if you don't change our heart, we can be faithful to you. It is why we want to submit everything in your guidance so that we can give our first fruits all the time. And uh, as you promise that the blessing will overflow it for us, we want to thank you for that. As you put our heart to be generous, we want to, to you to continue to bless us. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Hello, friends. Jackson M. Dogger Jr. here to remind you, be counted in the 2020 census. Make sure everyone in your church and in your sphere of influence is counted in the 2020 census. It will make a difference in your life. Good morning, everyone. 
Let us pray. Most gracious and precious Lord, we thank you that we have this opportunity. When we survey the universes to think that you condescend to listen to our prayers here on this speck of a planet, we thank you, Lord, that you feel that way about us. And if we should ever wonder or question how you feel about us, let us turn to Calvary and see you there, Jesus, dying on the cross so that every single human being who chooses salvation can have salvation. Lord, we are awed at this moment to be in your presence. We have the power of prayer at our fingertips and so many of us underutilize that power. You have shown me, dear Lord, that we should pray about everything. Your word says, pray about everything and worry about nothing. If we pray more, we will not have the opportunity to worry. And in fact, if we worry, we may as well not pray because you will not listen to prayers of those who worry. Let us learn the lesson that Jesus showed us when he walked this earth. He prayed about everything and you gave him power, dear Lord, to heal the sick and to tell parables and stories about how the kingdom of heaven should be understood. We thank you for giving Jesus to give us the example. And Lord, we are thankful that we have such an example. He is the best example. As we pause now to think about what's going on in the world, let us not worry because you have it under control. Let us not focus on what we see going on around the world we see COVID-19, we have to wear masks, we have to make sure we wash our hands. Let us do our part and then trust in the Lord. Trust that you will keep us COVID free. Help us Lord to trust you more. That's what we need to do more than anything else that we can learn and that is to trust you more. When we find ourselves in unbelief, like the man who came to Jesus and asked for healing for his child. And Jesus said, all things are possible if you believe. And the man cried out, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Help us, Lord, to trust you from the rising of the sun till the going down of the same. We come to you today, Lord, and ask you to bless the man of the hour as he breaks the bread of life to us. Let him speak your words to us. And although we cannot gather in the church, let us gather around the whatever medium we have, whether it be our television that we have put YouTube on, or whether it be our phones or our personal computers. Let us gather around and listen to what you have in store for us. We praise you, mighty God. We thank you, mighty God. We appreciate everything that you have already done and are doing and will do so that when you break that eastern sky, we will all be ready. We thank you again in your mighty and holy name. Amen.
Hey, happy Sabbath, new life. Welcome back to our current sermon series, which is entitled Terrarium. And this is a sermon series on the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, just by way of recap, if this is your first Sabbath with us, uh, and even if for, for those that have been with us the past couple of Sabbaths, uh, this is our, our third installment, our third sermon in this series. But I want to give you uh, sort of an, an overview of what we have gone over so far. So uh, actually last week, Elder Brown uh, spoke to us on Ecclesiastes chapter three. There's a time for everything and a season for everything under the sun. Now that that phrase right there under the sun is what was uh, preached about or, or talked about on our first Sabbath together for this series under the sun. What does Solomon, whom we believe to be the author of this book, Ecclesiastes, what does he mean by under the sun? Well, Solomon is giving us a clue about what life is like outside of heaven, meaning this without God, what does what is life like? Like under this this fishbowl, uh, just within the globe, uh, you know, within this terrarium, if you will, outside of heaven's perspective. Under the sun is exactly what he means. And it means that this, this is uh, an, an earthly and human perspective that he's presenting to us. See, in fact, Solomon is addressing uh, life from a secular point of view. He, he is taking secularism head on. Now, I told you, this is going to be very, very applicable to the times that we live in. We're living in the year of our Lord, 2020. And we are dealing with a very secular society. We are de dealing with secular viewpoints. And Ecclesiastes is going to be one of the perfect books for the time of the end. Yes, the times that we are living in even now. And so Solomon is taking kind of this pessimistic view of what life is like outside of the purview of God. He's very pessimistic. He, he is kind of a, a Debbie Downer. Uh, he says that vanity is vanity, all is vanity. Well, he doesn't mean that life is vanity when you are uh, serving God. In fact, God gives us purpose because he created us and he redeemed us. So for those of us that are uh, that are Bible believing Christians that have that personal relationship with God, uh, we, we know that we have a purpose. Our lives have value. We have purpose. But, uh, you know, for those that do not serve God, that believe that life is, you know, has evolved from whatever it evolved from and, and will continue on. Well, for those that have that perspective, well, life is going to be meaningless. And so he's taking that perspective uh, even, even now. So for today, for this third sermon in the series, Terrarium, I have a text of scripture. It's Ecclesiastes chapter seven. And I was, I was tempted to uh, read extensively verses one through 14. Um, but we, we're just going to read four verses. So we're just going to stick to one through four. But when you get a chance, go ahead and read that that whole chapter. Most of the chapter is going to be dealing with uh, the subject matter that we're going to be talking about today. But just for those four verses and I'm, I'm reading from a version that I am falling more and more in love with uh, just about every single day. And it's the NLT, the New Li Living Translation. That's what I'm going to be reading in your hearing from. So again, Ecclesiastes chapter seven. Verses one through four. Here's what the Bible says. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. Now, right off the bat, this is almost proverbial in its wisdom. Makes a lot of sense. No one would dispute this, right? Good reputation is more valuable than, than costly perfume. You can't, um, you, you can't buy a good reputation. It's something that has to be earned. But then, then in, in the second part of verse one, Solomon just seems to take a turn for the worst. Like it, it's really a head scratcher here until we really unpack exactly what he means. Here's what he says. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Really, uh, it's a head scratcher. Then, then he goes on. It, it doesn't end right there. Verse two, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Verse three, Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. And finally, verse four, a wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. 
Uh, the title for our message today is Funeral Crashes. That's right. I didn't say wedding crashes. I said funeral crashes. If you wouldn't mind uh, saying a word of prayer with me even now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this moment. Lord, we approach this text of scripture with great respect. Lord, we believe that all scripture is inspired by God, not just the ones that we think make more sense than others, not just the ones that agree with our lifestyle or agree with our worldview. Uh, Lord, we believe all scripture is inspired by God, even weird texts such as this. But Lord, help us to understand exactly what you mean in this passage of scripture so that we can be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our title is Funeral Crasher. See, about 15 years ago, uh, exactly in the year 2005, a movie was produced uh, called Wedding Crashers. That's right. Wedding Crashers. It, it, it's a, a rom-com, if you will. It, it's a romantic comedy. And, and it's about two main characters, John and Jeremy, who crash weddings in an attempt to meet and seduce bridesmaids. Now, let me just pause right here. I know that we're in church. I know that this is a religious and, and, and spiritual thing that, that we're doing right now. So just bear with me. Uh, but again, they are crashing weddings in an attempt to meet and seduce bridesmaids. And if you don't know what crashing wedding means, it, it means to show up uninvited, unannounced. You don't know nobody there. You're just crashing it uh, just to be there, just to have a good time. And they were doing this for their own personal pleasurable pursuits. Now, after several escapades, John, one of the main characters, doesn't believe in love anymore. See, what happened was he and his his, his friend, uh, Jeremy, they were uh, co-workers and best friends. Uh, they they crashed one particular wedding and she was the the, the daughter of a uh, famous man. And um, and they, they crashed his wedding and John uh, fell in love with one of the sisters of that daughter. And uh, they they ended up, you know, going out a, a couple of times, but uh, long story short, th their love just didn't work out. And uh, he ended up not believing in love anymore. She ends up being uh, engaged to another man and he's just going through it. He He's depressed. He's just going through all of those emotions. Now, John, visits a, a wedding crasher guru. His name is Chaz, who's played by comedian Will Ferrell. And he he just needs a pick-me-up. He, he, he really needs to, try, he's trying to figure life out. And so he goes to his wedding crasher guru named Chaz, and he convinces John to crash a funeral with him. That's right, a funeral. See, John finds out that Chaz, their wedding crashing mentor, had stopped crashing weddings. He said that, that you know, I, I'll throw in a wedding every now and then, but he said funerals is really where it's at. He found that crashing funerals reaped better results for him, according to Chaz. Now, at that funeral, John, the main character, observes the grieving widow at the graveside of her now deceased husband, and he reconsiders his belief in love and marriage. Now, here's the thing. John doesn't learn the meaning of love and marriage from a wedding. He doesn't show up at, at, at the wedding ceremony. He doesn't show up at, at, at the party afterwards knowing or, or learning about love and marriage. It was at a funeral, at a negative event, what we would call a negative event, to learn what love and marriage is all about. See, he knew that at this at this funeral, that this bride or this, uh, th this widow, I, I should say, uh, she really, really loved her deceased husband. And he's figuring out, okay, there is something called love in this world, not just something that, that happens on a wedding day where we say, I do, we're so excited. And then we live for the rest of our lives just in unhappiness. He didn't learn that at, at, at a wedding. He learned at a funeral that you can have love, that you can have a, a successful and a thriving relationship. But he learned it at a funeral. See, John learned that day what we all should be learning. And it's the fact that death is the best teacher. Death is a great preacher. In fact, it pre death preaches so well that it, it wears the robe of the best preachers. Death is such a great teacher. And if you're not learning something from death, that event, then you're probably not going to learn anything at all. And I'm convinced that death, yes, death itself 
provides the true perspective on our lives. Now, last week, Elder Brown uh, spoke a very inspiring message to us about, and this is from Ecclesiastes chapter three, and he, he talked about there being a time for everything. See, Solomon inserted this poem, if you will, into Ecclesiastes chapter three, and he said that there's a time uh, to, to, to heal and a time to, to, to uh, not heal. There, there's a time to, to sow and there's a time to reap. There's a time to throw stones. There's a time to gather up stones. But one of those most important things that, that Solomon said in that poem, he said that there is a time to be born and there is a time to die. See, the reality for all of us is that, well, we were all born on a certain day. We all have birthdays, right? But we really don't think that much about the fact that if Jesus delays his coming, that we all have a day that we will pass away. It is just a fact of life. That, that's what happens. We all are born and we will all pass away if Jesus continues to delay his coming. And we should live in light of the fact that we will eventually pass away. That's right. See, we, we uh, uh, Solomon makes this fact even more clear uh, a couple chapters later in Ecclesiastes chapter nine and verse five. And it's a very popular passage in, especially in Adventist theology, where Solomon says, for the living know that they will die, but the dead, you can say it with me, know not anything. That's right. You got it. See, in, 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 and then it goes on in, in uh, verse six, where it talks about the, you know, the love that we have and the passions, all of those things are, are, they pass away when, when we die. Right. And so in, in Adventist theology, normally when we quote this passage of scripture, we'll talk about it from the perspective of the state of the dead. Right. So the, you know, the dead don't know anything. You can't come back from the dead, um, and, and speak to your dead relatives that, that can't possibly happen. And that is actually a very good secondary interpretation of this text, but a primary interpretation of it, you know, Solomon wasn't trying to prove anything about the state of the dead. He was actually trying to say that life is a, that death rather is the best teacher that we could ever have. Why? Well, the dead are already dead. Once you die, there's nothing else that you have. You can't come back and ask, uh, ask, um, ask for someone's forgiveness. You can't apologize after you die. You can't come back and love anyone anymore after you die. He said that the living know that they will die. And if the living know that they, that we will die, look, use that as the opportunity to learn your lesson from it. If you know that you're going to die, if death is, is, is a sure thing, then we all need to live in light of the fact that we will eventually die. Live in light of that fact. Live in light of the fact that we don't have all the time in the world. And if we're all going to die, then we need to know or we need to live in light of that fact. And so in verse one, that second part uh, of Ecclesiastes chapter seven, Solomon says, look, the day of death is better than the day of birth. And he's not saying that and it is not some some morbid uh, morbid fact where he's just in love with this, nothing like that. What Solomon is saying is that the day of death is a better teacher than the day of, uh, than the day of birth. See, when, 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 uh, we experience birth, you know, it's a happy time, happy time. Uh, we, we are, we, we rejoice in the birth of new babies. I, you know, it, it, it's just hearing the cooing of babies hearing, yeah, yeah. Even hearing them cry for the first time, seeing them take their first steps and, you know, it, it is a very happy time, but you can't really learn a whole lot of lessons from the day of birth. You, you don't say, uh, you know, the, the, uh, about the baby, uh, you know, they're, they're so mature because they're not mature. You can't talk about the lessons that the baby has learned, uh, on their day of their birth, but, on, you know, near to the end of people's lives, People start reflecting over their whole life and what they have learned. Yeah, even uh, we, we, you know, I, 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 some of my favorite times is sitting down with my grandparents whom, you know, I know that they don't have all the time in the world. In, in fact, they probably have more behind them than, than they have ahead of them. That That's just a fact of life. But I love sitting down and asking them questions when I'm in their presence. Hey, what was life like when you grew up? How, how are things different now? What? 
What lessons have you learned throughout your life? What are some of your joys? What are some of your sorrows? I love sitting down and listening to those that are more mature than I, those that are that that may be closer to that realm, to the other realm uh, than, than, than I might be, just so that I can learn the lessons that they have been learning throughout their whole lives. And, and you know, when people are, uh, you know, in, in that casket, what, what are some of the things that, that we say about them? Well, you know, they were so much like Jesus or uh, they were so kind or so generous. Or, you know, some people may not say it at a funeral, but you might think, man, this person was just really selfish. They, they weren't generous at all. They All they did was live for themselves and themselves alone. But whether it's a positive lesson or a negative lesson, it's still a lesson that is learned. There are some times that you learn what to do and there are other times where you learn what not to do because of somebody else's life. And it is just a, a fact of the matter. I remember several months ago, I have a cousin that was shot and killed in in uh, in, in the D.C. Heightsville uh, area where I, I live uh, here in Heightsville. And uh, his funeral was in Heightsville and they asked me to preach a funeral for him. Now, I didn't know him. I had never met him, but I knew his father. Um, and um, so they, they asked me to preach his funeral. There, there was never a time in my life, in my ministry that I preached to more people that didn't attend church, right? You know, we're, we're talking about um, people that they 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 weren't they their customs in life weren't exactly what my customs in life were. But when I got to that funeral, just hearing the testimonies of people observing my younger cousin and how great of a father he was. You know, he he always took time out for his children. I mean, these were just great, great lessons that people are learning about life from the death of somebody else. When, 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 you, when you observe death, it's a different story. And so Solomon, I believe, is, is teaching us, hey, look, there are happy times in life and we ought to celebrate. He's not saying that we shouldn't celebrate babies being born or celebrate uh, people tying the knot in, at, at, at a wedding. Those are good celebrations, but he's saying that you're going to be able to learn much more from a funeral than you are from a wedding or from a baby shower. So if you're going to crash anything, if you're going to go to any kind of party, make sure that you crash a funeral. Make sure you just sit there and, and in the pews and, and observe what's being said from the pulpit. Observe people's reactions to those that are deceased. Crash not just weddings. Don't just crash a, a baby shower, but make sure you crash a funeral, show up uninvited, sit down and learn a lesson in the greatest classroom that life could ever offer us. Left to our own devices, we tend to live life forward, meaning from this point on, I'm going to live until I can't live anymore. But, but Solomon is challenging us, instead of living life forward, live life backwards. You know, start at the very end. If you start at the end, you know what kind of life you want to live. You, you, you know what you want people to say about you at your funeral. You know that you do not want to live a selfish life. So if by the end of, uh, of your life, uh, you, if you start with the end in mind and you live life backwards, you're more likely to live out the kind of life that you really, really want to live. And you'll find out that when you keep death in view, that you really don't have much control over anything. You don't have much control over, you know, what you eat or what what um, what how secure your job might be. You don't have much control over how healthy you will be. Of course, our choices have a lot to do with that. But you know, look, diseases, autoimmune diseases, and any any other kind of diseases, they rise up at a moment's notice. No matter how healthy you live your life, life happens. You have no control over home prices. You have no control. Over interest rate prices, we know, understand that over the course of the past several months that uh, those have been very low. Well, they're going to rise back up at some point. Look, you have no control or very little control over life and death will teach you that very thing. So live life in light of the end. The house of mourning is better than the house of mirth and mirth is just happiness and, and enjoyment. Why? Well, it's not a morbid thing, but he's saying that the house of mourning is just going to be a better teacher for you. And I love what Psalm, uh, the 90th Psalm says. It says, teach us to number our days. 
Why? That we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Teach us, Lord, to live as if we're living with the end in view. Why do you want, why, why do we want God to do it? Well, so that we can have a heart full of wisdom. We it takes wisdom to live in light of the end. And those are the two, there are gonna be two responses of everyone at a funeral. Number one, if you're at a funeral, and this was, you know, some of the responses of, of people uh, that were at my cousin's funeral uh, several months ago. Uh, the, the first response is, is to try to escape. That, that, there's an escapist response. Uh, you, you, you just, you're, when, you, when you're living in light of death and, and you just don't understand what's going on under the sun, you have an under the, under the sun perspective. You're not seeing life in terms of the ultimate reality of God and his grace and his faithfulness to us. You, you try to escape that life. So, you know, while we were there, uh, as soon as I exited the, the, uh, the, the funeral uh, and we were about to go on our way to uh, to the burial. Uh, all you can smell was weed in the air. People were walk were, were standing around with bottles and uh, trying to get themselves drunk. Why? Because it's an attempt to escape the reality that's there for all of us. The, the people know that eventually it's going to be them that's going to be right there at the front of the altar or someone else that they might love. And there's a, a temptation to try to escape, to drown it all out with, with, with alcohol, with uh, possibly with drugs, maybe even with sex. You, you try to feel good about it, try to keep those, the, the, those good feelings going as long as possible. You try to escape it. But I'm confident that that's not God's response for what's going on in this world. That's, that's, that's number one. There, like I said, there, there are two responses. Number one is the escapist response. And then the second response is the wise person, the wise person's response. See, a wise person knows that it's not just a morbid thing that death is, but death can give us depth, that, that death can give us depth of life, depth of, of our souls, depth of our character. When we actually sit down and contemplate everything that's going on. Two responses. What will your response be? We we all know the living know that they shall die. You know that you're gonna die. I, I'm not trying to be a pessimist here, but you know that it will come eventually. What will your response be? Will you try to escape it and try to drown out as much of the pain and everything as, as you possibly can? Or will you be wise and embrace it and say, okay, I know that I'm gonna die. Let me live life for God as much as I possibly can. See, when, when we get to that time in our lives, when we start winding things down in life, you know, most people, the vast majority of people, I don't know anyone that is towards the end of their life and, and they regret that they could have made more money. I, I don't know anyone that, that has ever said that. I, I wish that I had, I had tried to climb the corporate ladder more quickly. I, I, I wish that I had tried to gather more things for my, I wish I had lived for myself even more. No, that's not the story that people have towards the end of their lives. You know what people say towards the end of their lives when they're nearing death? Man, I wish I had spent more time with my kids. I, I wish that I had been a better spouse. You know, the concerns that people have at the end of their lives isn't about material things. It's not that I wish I had bought a bigger house. It's not that I, have, I wish I had a faster car. That's not what people are worried about towards the end of their lives. People aren't worried about material things. They're more worried about my relationships. I wish that I had apologized at one time. I, I wish that, that we could have worked things out. I wish that my kids could have been around me. I wish that I could have been around them more. People at the end of their lives, when death is right around the corner, are more worried about their relationships than they are about material things. And if that's what people are worried about towards the end of their lives, then we who might have more ahead of us than, than behind us should more so be concerned about those very things, about our relationships. We should put more time into them, more effort into them, and not just into material things. Because at the end of our lives, we can't take anything with us. But we can make the impact during our very lives, even right now, for people to carry on our legacy after we are gone. So what are you concerned about? What will your response be at the end of your life? And I'm confident that not just our own deaths, 
but the death of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us on Calvary should be the ultimate, uh, that should be the, the, the ultimate gathering stone for us. When we reflect not just on our own deaths, but reflect on his death, what he did for his uh, for his funeral was the ultimate life lesson for all of us because he gave his life away for us. He knew what was really important. In fact, Jesus wasn't really into material things at all. The Bible says that uh, he had uh, nowhere to lay his head. He, he didn't own anything. Jesus was more concerned about relationships and that's exactly why he died. So if you're going to crash anything, don't crash a wedding. Don't crash a baby shower. Don't crash a graduation party. Make sure that you crash a funeral. For at funerals is where we learned life's most important lessons. Hey, look, I I'm inviting you this week to take some time to just think about your own death. I know it sounds morbid. I I that is not my intention at all. But I, I just want you to just think about it. What do you want people to say about you? How do you want your life to have been lived? And however you want that to happen, look, you've got to start living like that even now. Will you be more concerned about your relationships now so that you, people will know, hey, this was a family man. This, she loved her family. Uh, or, or will you continue to be more interested in, in material things or, or in secularism? Look, you've got to make a decision now, hey, I am going to live right now how I want people to view me at the end of my life. And guess what? If you start that right now, if you accept this invitation to just think about your own funeral just for a few minutes this week, I guarantee you that your life will be better for it. Hey, everyone, if you've been blessed by this content, especially by this sermon series, make sure that you subscribe down below and just click the subscribe button. And every single time we uh, have a church service, it'll go straight to your inbox. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Did not our hearts burn within us this Sabbath afternoon? Did not pass the lead, we preached the word of God. My prayer is that those words may not fall on deaf ears, but that it will carry us throughout the new week. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, we thank you for the words that you have proclaimed today. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the message of Pastor Troy Levy. Now, Lord, allow that message to be living within our body that we ourselves may go out and proclaim the gospel as living sacrifices. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church of God say amen and amen.